What makes giving uh, a discussion on this topic so difficult is you have to pick which of those to select. Because there's so many, you cannot cover them all in a short 45-minute uh, discussion. But we'll do our best to cover a few of them. And my hope in discussing them is that we'll be inspired by these lessons to then go right back and read the seventh canto in detail and pull out all of the lessons that are available to us because we'll only cover a small fraction. But all of them are equally powerful and equally potent and helpful to us. So this story comes about through an inquiry from Yudhishthira Maharaj. Yudhishthira Maharaj inquires from Narada Muni. He says, Maharaj Yudhishthira inquired, Oh my Lord Narada Muni, why was there such enmity between Hirani Kashipu and his beloved son, Prahlad Maharaj? How did Prahlad Maharaj become such a great devotee of Lord Krishna? Kindly explain this to me. So, Narada Muni is explaining a lot of different topics and he it just makes a one reference to this nature of how Narada Kashipu became quite inimical to his son Prahlad Maharaj. And Yudhish Maharaj says, wait, how did this happen? I want to learn more. This in and of itself is a great instruction for us. Srila Vyasadeva in the beginning of the Vedanta Sutra says, Atato Brahma Jinyasa. That in the human form of life, we have this intelligence. It is a rare gift. We sometimes don't appreciate its rarity. But there are 8.4 million species of life. And only in the human form of life do we have the ability to inquire, to ask questions. And if throughout our journey in this life, we don't use this intelligence to ask very important questions, and we simply aspire to eat nicely, sleep nicely, make nicely, and defend nicely, then we are no different than all other 8.4 million species of life. So this human species of life is meant to inquire and to ask very deep questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What are the other places that are available? Why is there suffering in the world? What is the keys to peace and happiness? These sorts of things, we should be using the intelligence we've been given to inquire. This is the instruction from Shilaviyasadeva, and you have worked very hard to come to this human form of life. And if you don't use this intelligence wisely, you're being very miserly, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, you're being a kripana, one who has great facilities, but is not using them. So Yudhishthira Maharaj is showing us that when we come to something that we have some question on, we should ask. Spirituality is not about a one-way dialogue, but it is about questions and answers. Questions and answers. So that we can exhaust our doubts and then take to the path of spiritual life with great faith and confidence. So Yudhishthira Maharaj is very perplexed and confused as to how father and son can become enemies. What could lead to such a circumstance? And how did his young boy Prahlad become such a great devotee? That also is of great uh, curiosity. So Yudhishthira Maharaj inquires. And so from that point, Shukadeva Goswami goes into explaining in great detail the pastime of Yarni Kashipu, the Lagaran, and the Lord Vishnu. So we'll discuss that a little bit uh, uh, in summary form. We'll have a wonderful drama in a short while in which we'll be able to see this pastime come to life before our eyes. So we'll use this discussion as an opportunity to prepare to and understand what it is that we're actually seeing. So Hiranyakashipu was the brother of Hiranyaksh. And Hiranyaksh was killed by Brahade, the boar incarnation of the Supreme Lord. He was a demon performing great atrocities. And so the Lord descended to save the pious people and killed Hiranyaksh. So Hiranyakashipu, being the loving brother, became very upset and angry. 
And so he took a vow that he would kill the Supreme Court. Now we see that is impossible, you know, that the Supreme Lord is the Almighty, the source of all strength, as we read in this verse. But when we come and become bewildered by our false ego and maya, we start to think things that are actually impossible. And so Hirani Kashiku became very uh, determined to destroy the Supreme Lord. But Hirani Kashiku also had some intelligence. While the family members of his brother were lamenting the death of their uh, relative, he began to expound great philosophy about how we are not this body, we are a spirit soul, one should not lament the changing of the clothes, and all the great philosophy that Krishna gives us in Bhagavad Gita to understand that as a Dina, as a sober person, you know, the spirit soul is eternal, the body is temporary, we should not lament. But despite that uh, knowledge, it was ultimately misapplied. And he took his knowledge and he decided that he was going to acquire great powers to be able to conquer everyone. But even in that endeavor, he knew that the So even in that endeavor, he knew that the source of his power wasn't going to be going to the gym and pumping some iron, eating lots of spinach and dal and rice. That he needed another power to bestow power upon him. And so he understood that Lord Brahma, the Indian power creator, acquired great ability by tapasya, by austerity. So here in Kashipu went to undertake great austerity and tapasya. You know, many of us are fasting today, it is the appearance day of Lord Nishiki Day. We are having some tapasya, some austerity. We are wondering, oh, when will dust come so we can honor Prashada, bring our fast? <laughs> when the Kadashi comes, we think, oh, tomorrow I can eat grains. Like this, we do some tapasya. What kind of tapasya here in Nikashi did? He was observing a full Nirjala fast. But not just fasting. He was standing on the tips of his toes, not on the flats of his feet, but on the very tips of his toes, like a ballerina. They trained for years to be able to stand on their toes. But Hiranika Shibu was standing on his toes, hands raised in the sky, perfectly still, for a few minutes, for an hour, a day or two, months, thousands of years. Over hundred celestial years, he stood like that and performed great austerity around his entire body and until it formed. And ants began to eat away at the flesh. Still, he was undisturbed. He was left with just basically bones and a life air, but his meditation unbroken. This is how determined he was to his goal. You see, determination. Breathes the opportunity to persevere through many obstacles. So he was performing austerity like this in such intense austerity that heat, fire was emanating from his head and it was starting to suffocate the whole universe. And so the, the demigods became very fearful. They went to Lord Brahma and said, Lord Brahma, you have to do something. This Hiranyakashi was performing such intense meditation to you and he's starting to suffocate the universe. Please come. And save us. So Lord Brahma said, okay, I'm coming. So he came down. He had to first find him in Akashiku. He could see the heat, but he couldn't see him. This giant anvil had consumed his whole form. And seeing that condition, he sprinkled some water from his top upon Yoni Kashiku and he and assumed a very beautiful, golden, lustrous, powerful form. And here I think I see Lord Brahma offer the patiences. We'll see, offering the patiences. This will become a little bit odd in a few minutes. But he offered the patiences. And then he asked for a boon, a benediction. Of course, his, his tapasya was very motivation. He, there was a purpose for his tapasya. He wanted the powers. And so he asked Lord Brahma, make me immortal. And Lord Brahma said, well, I am not immortal. How can I give you something I don't have? 
If I have $100, you can't come and ask me for $110. I don't have it. I can give you what I have. So Lord Brahma, himself not being immortal, could not bestow immortality. So Hiranyakashipu, thinking to himself very smart, said, okay, let me outsmart this Lord Brahma. He won't give me immortality. I'll get immortality indirectly. And he tells Lord Brahma, okay, let me not be killed in the day or night. Let me not be killed in the air or on the ground. Let me not be killed by any creature created by you. Let me not be killed by any weapon. Let me not be killed inside or outside. Like this, he gave all these things. And he covered all his angles, 360 degrees, of all the potential threats to him. And he thought, checkmate. I got my immortality. So Hirani Kashipu received all these benedictions, all these powers. But we know, when one who has an impure heart, when they come to power, what do they most often do with it? Misuse. They misuse it. And the misuse of Hirani Kashipu's power is epic and unbeknownst to mankind. We see today many, many misuses of power. We have many mini Hirani Kashipu's running around. But Hirani Kashipu is the author of misuse of power. So when he gained this power, he unleashed a reign of terror unseen before. He had the whole of creation, all three worlds, the upper planetary systems, the middle planetary systems, and even the lower planetaries, all under his control. They were all serving him under great fear. He usurped Lord Indra's palace, Occupied his home, this great uh, place that Vishukarma had created. And from there he was enacting so much terror and fear. Everybody was trembling at the fear of Hirani Kashipu. If he simply just raised his eyebrows, people would fall and ask, What can I do, my master? Shukadev Goswami says, Every single person, the great rishis, the great sages, even the demigods, they all fell under his control, except for three people, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and Lord Vishnu. But for these three, Hiranyakashipu had everybody under his control. Even Mother Earth was so fearful of Hiranyakashipu that she was producing food grains without even having to be cultivated. Imagine that. You don't have to plant the seeds and grains are coming being so fearful. The rivers were uh, delivering profuse amounts of jewels and gems, being fearful of the wrath of Hiranyakashipu. This was the Imam. He had full and complete control of the whole universe. He had all the wealth under his disposition. Everybody knew who Hiranyakashipu was. He was fully famous. And this was the extent of his power. But then how he became on the side of the How he became on the side. And that brings us to the great Brahma. Hiranyakashipu had control over everyone except for one. Who? Still, 
one will not find peace and happiness. That is the nature of the material world. The spirit soul, being spirit, will not find happiness from matter. Spirit and matter do not mix. It is like oil and water. Spirit finds its happiness from spirit, the Supreme Spirit. And so Hirani Kashibu, he acquired everything that everyone in the world today is working day and night, week after week, year after year, trying to acquire some more wealth, some more control, more fame, more this, all for the hopes of peace and happiness. But Hirani Kashibu had accomplished it all and still he was unsatisfied because he couldn't control one young five-year-old boy. And because of that inability to tolerate that, as we'll see in a few moments, it led to his complete and utter destruction. And this is the end result of all greed. This is the fallacy that we think by getting a little bit more, a little bit more, I'm going to satisfy it. But unfortunately, it's like trying to put out a fire by pouring fuel on it. And ultimately, that thirst for whatever objects we are chasing for becomes so intense that it overcomes our intelligence and we ultimately lose everything. And we see this in Hirani Kashyapu. We see this in the Ravan. We see this with so many persons. We see it in the modern day. Great, great businessmen, great, great politicians, you know, famous people, due to greed, start to lose control of their lives and they lose everything. So this is nothing new, nor is it something only in the past. It is still present today. And this is the nature of material greed. It's never satisfied. And then we can compare it to Prabhupada. So the, the story unfolds that Hirani Kashipu um, you know, once called his son onto his lap and said, My dear child, you know, tell me, what have you learned in school? Seemingly a very simple question, right? When our children come home, we ask them, Oh, what did you learn in school today? It's a very natural thing. Parents do this with children. So here in the country, people like to ask, What did you learn in school? And Prahlad Maharaj replies, Oh, best of the Asuras. <laughs> he doesn't say, Oh, Father. <laughs> he said, oh, best of the Asuras. And Hirani Kashi was like, oh, yes. My son is so great. He's respectful. He knows I am the best of the demons. <laughs> of course, that's the what he's saying. Uh, it's not a great compliment. <laughs> he says, oh, best of the Asuras. What did I learn? I learned that you are dying in material life. You are living in a well with no water. You should retire to the forest, go to Vrindavan, and worship the Supreme Lord. <laughs> and Mikashi Guru was like, What? My enemy? Lord Vishnu? You're done. How have you become polluted? He called the teacher Sanda and Amarka, who are the sons of Shukracharya. Our boy, my boy has become polluted. Somebody is coming and preaching to him. You find out how this has happened and protect him. You know, we protect ourselves in the emotional life from that association. Here in the was thinking, I have to protect my child from this, you know, these uh, Vaishnava philosophy, these preachers. You know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement has gone back in time and is propagating this philosophy. And so, the Sangha and Marka go back and they begin to, you know, Speak with Prabhupada. So, you know, when you want to get something out of a young boy, you want to give him some secret, what do you do? You bribe him. You just give him some candy, you pet him, you give him, you know, prop him up a little bit. So, Sadhana and Marga are, you know, really talking sweetly to Prabhupada Maharaj, trying to find out who has infiltrated our camp and is talking to all of us. But Prabhupada Maharaj is unshakable. And so he, you know, uh, explains. We have no friends, we have no enemies. Stop thinking in this way. This is a materially embodied consciousness. You know, we're all one as servants of the Supreme Lord. Give up this me versus you idea. But of course, they did not. So they began to instruct Prahlad Maharaj and 
all of the politics of demon life, you know, how to be a great demon, how to usurp people's property, how to inflict the fear upon the innocent, how to exert power over the weak, all these things that demons are very good at. And they try to teach and teach and teach. And after some time, they became sensitive. Yes, now our Allah is rightly situated in demon shastri, fully versed in all the principles of demonism. So they brought him in front of Yani Kashimoto. His mother, Kayalu, bathed him, put some nice clothes on him, and then presented him. And Yerni Kashim was so loving to his son, and tears are flowing. He's petting his son. He says, Oh, my dear child, what have you learned from school today? And what did uh, Prahlad Maharaj say? Did he start expounding the philosophies of demonism? No, he was unfair. And he began to preach and expounded, you know, the nine very powerful processes of devotional service: shravana, kirtana, vishnu smarana, vandana, padasena, arjuna, dasya, sakya, atma divaya. These processes of bhakti. This is the perfection of life. My dear father, you should follow this practice of devotional service. Uncontrolled, and he threw his son off his lap. I can see how lost in consciousness Yanni Kashyap became. That he threw his own child off his lap. And he became very angry. And he's trying to understand how this can all happen. And then he started to rationalize. He said, You know, <clears throat> Sometimes uh, in the forest, there are some trees that have to be removed so that the desired trees can grow. In the garden, in order for the desired crop to grow, we have to remove the weeds. Even sometimes on the body, if there is a sick part of the body, we have to amputate it, remove it to protect the rest of the body. So he thought, like this, this Prahlad, he is going to ruin our dynasty. Better we kill him now and save the rest of the dynasty. And so he convinced himself, this is the right path. I should kill my son. This is the depth of how consciousness can fall when we lose sight of who we are in our relationship with the Supreme Lord. That even our own logic can convince us that killing our own son is right and justified. And so this way he rationalized that he should kill his son. <clears throat> and so he sent his ministers. But Prahlad Maharaj was untouched by all the weapons of these people. They were bringing big, big tridents, spears. And they could not even touch the smallest portion of Prahlad's soft, delicate skin. Then they raised the stakes. Karnakashi was decided, you know, throw him from a cliff. But not die. Put him in front of a stampede of elephants. Throw him into a pit of snakes. Into a blazing fire. Into a freezing freezer. All kinds of means concocted. But Prahlad Maharaj was not to be killed. But not only was he not killed, what was his state of mind? He was completely peaceful, subdued and calm. How much fear do we have in life? <clears throat> Imagine fiery demons coming at us with tridents. How our heart would react. We have one small mouse in our house and we're like, oh, there's a mouse. <laughs> and we can't stop thinking of it. We hit one small ball in an airplane. Our heart starts racing. Some noise comes in the middle of the night and we get up. There's fear at every moment. But Prahlad Maharaj, in the midst of these extremely fearful circumstances, 
he was fully calm and composed. How? How was the source of his peace? If we go to this verse now that I read in the beginning, Hirani Kashipu is perplexed. He says, You are like a dog's curved tail. <laughs> what does a dog's curved tail have to do with Prahlad Maharaj? Anybody ever try to straighten a dog's curved tail? <laughs> if you straighten it, what happens to it? <laughs> you straighten it? <laughs> Just keep, you can't straighten it. He says, no matter how much I try to shake you, instill fear in you, you remain fearless. I have the whole universe scared of me. The whole universe is shaking if I just raise my eyebrow. But I am inflicting all of my power into putting fear into you. And I haven't moved you in the slightest. So he asked, my son Prahlad, you rascal, you know when I'm angry all the planets of the three worlds tremble along with their chief rulers. By whose power has a rascal like you become so impudent that you appear fearless and overstep my power to rule you? Say to Hirani Kashmir, where did your power come from? So Prahlad Maharaj said, as we read in the opening verse, My dear king, the source of my strength, of which you are asking, is also the source of yours. Indeed, the original source of all kinds of strength is one. He is not only the strength of your strength or mine, he is the strength of everyone. Without him, no one can get any strength. Whether moving or not moving, superior or inferior, everyone, including Lord Brahma, is controlled by the strength of the Supreme Personality of God. So Prahlad Maharaj answers his father. So I'll come back to this dialogue in a second. But what was the source of Prahlad Maharaj's fearlessness? How many of us would like to be fearless? How many of us would like to be able to walk this world day after day without the anxiety and fear of all the things that perplex us. It would be great. We would consider it to be very powerful. So where this fearlessness comes from? How Prahlad Maharaj became so fearless? It was in his devotional service. It was in his Vishnu Shmaya. His fixed uh, meditation on the Supreme Lord. And the faith in the Supreme Lord Himself. It was not blind faith, it was informed faith. <clears throat> Krishna says throughout Bhagavad Gita that I am your protector, I am your well-wisher, I am your swift deliverer. I preserve what you have, carry what you lack. Repeatedly is giving assurances. Prahlad Maharaj understood one thing. Every living entity is fully dependent on who? The Supreme Personality of God, Sri Sri Mahakrishna. We are all dependent on Him. Whatever protection we want, it comes from one source, the Supreme One. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhokana Vikata Pasam, Sarva Loka Maheshwara. Surdam Sarva Bhutan. Nyakama Shantim Vichiti. Shantim, this peace you want. You can get it when you know three things. Bhoktara Vikata Pasam. I, Krishna speaking, is the beneficiary of all yajna. All yajna, all sacrifices ultimately culminate in me. I am the source of all this creation and its maintainer and protector. Third, I am the well-wisher of earthly living entity. Krishna is the supreme well-wisher of earthly living entity. If you know these three things, then you can find peace. So Prahlad Maharaj understood very clearly. One, I am not this body. I am spirit soul. It is eternal. 
If Krishna wants my body to be consumed by these snakes, or trampled by these elephants, or burnt by this fire, then it will happen. He is the Supreme Controller. But He is my loving Father. I have full faith that whatever Krishna does for me is for my best. Just like an obedient child. Sometimes an obedient child is still chastised by mother and father. But in the heart that child knows, this is for my good. Like that, Prahlad Maharaj knew. Okay, whatever circumstance Krishna is arranging here, He's all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful. He's all-knowing, He knows it's happening. He's all-powerful, He could stop it if He wanted to. He's all-loving, if He thought it was just, He would. So if He chooses not to stop it, He must have a better plan for me. And thus, what is the need for me to remain disturbed? Let me have faith that my loving Father will never leave me. And so the source of his fearlessness was not a life insurance policy, was not a bulletproof vest, was not a big bank account to weather a depression, was not a vaccine to protect against the disease. It was faith in his Supreme Father, the Supreme Lord, being the all-loving, ever-well-wishing protector and love. So he understood. <coughs> and Prahlad Maharaj understood that when the Lord protects, He protects what is really valuable. See, when we have fear, we fear losing something that is of value. When we take our garbage out to the curb once a week, do we fear losing our garbage? Because we don't value it. We don't have fear of that. But what do we fear losing? Our car, our home, our family, our wealth, our fame, our reputation, our beauty. Why do we fear losing these things? Because we value them. But all of those things I just mentioned, we know without doubt, ultimately, we're going to lose them. That is the nature of the material world. But by coming to Krishna consciousness, one realizes all of this is temporary. But what is really valuable is my relationship with the Supreme Lord. And that is eternal to be taken away. That is my eternal opportunity. It is my eternal nature. And thus, for Allah Maharaj, understood, even losing this body, what is to fear? I've had millions of lives. I've had millions of lives. What is another one? So he remained peaceful. This doesn't mean we become careless with our body. Just hearing from Narada Muni for a few moments, he became fully purified. So Prahlad Maharaj did not have to go endure intense austerity. He did not have to endure great difficulty. Didn't even take very long time, a relatively short amount of time. He became fully powerful to find peace and happiness. Hirani Kashipu in austerity for thousands of years, and what was the result? Perfect peace and happiness? So we may labor in this material world for the rest of our lives and for many more lives to come, trying to find more material wealth, fame, power, beauty, eating nice and sleeping nice and bathing nice and defending nice. The twelve teachers of spiritual life by this process of hearing, so potent to this room. It is up to us to know what to do. In continuing in this narration, after this, the six enemies, the five senses and the mind, he says, when the mind is uncontrolled, it becomes our worst enemy. When the mind is controlled, it's our best of friends. But because you have not controlled your mind and the senses, and you can be saved and even enjoy all of your power. But was Hirani Kashipu ready to hear? He became more enraged, more angry. And thus, 
he's presented his final salutations. He began to doubt and question the Lord Lord, if you were to to a relationship with the Lord. And so here on the question of um, uh, Lord Nishingade, wanting to uphold the word of his devotee, exploded through the pillar. And now he appeared in a very interesting form. Half man, half lion. Why he appeared as a half man, half lion? Why did he come in his beautiful threefold bending form or so many other different forms? You know, why half man, half lion? <laughs> because his other devotee, Lord Brahma, had given a benediction to that will not be killed by man or beast. So he appeared as night. To uphold the word of his devotee, Lord Brahma, he adjusted his own ways. He could have killed Hirani Kashipu simply by one lightning strike. Forget one lightning strike. He could have just thought about it and boom, he'd be dead. But no. He wanted to uphold also the word of at dusk, neither day, neither night, in the on his lap, which is neither in the air or on the ground, with his nails, which is no weapon made by man. And then like this, he destroyed Narada which you'll see more elaborately in a short while in the drama. So I won't go into that more detail. But he upheld the word of his devotee in performing his actions. And so we see that the Lord is always there, protecting, loving, and exchanging with His devotees. This is the only means to finding the peace and happiness we search for. Krishna being the source of everything. It is our relationship with Him which brings about this perfection of life. And after performing this pastime, Lord Rishimine was extremely angry. Why was he angry? One thing you should learn in spiritual life, you should learn in spiritual life. You can mess with Krishna and provide offenses to Krishna, okay. But don't mess with his devotees. Krishna cannot tolerate Vaishnava Prabhupada. When his devotee is insulted, harmed, Krishna will not tolerate. He'll tolerate all the insults to himself. No problem. But don't hurt his devotees. And because Yarnakashipu had inflicted or tried to inflict so much distress upon his devotee, Krishna Day was in a fit of extraordinary rage. This is also Leela, pastime. But how strong was his rage? Lord Brahma would not approach to try to pacify him. From distance he offered prayers. He said, I'll not go close. He's too mad. They asked Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva said, I'm not going to go ahead. No, he is too mad. Then they approached Lakshmi Devi. Lakshmi Devi, you're always massaging the feet. Surely you can pacify him. No, thank you. I have never seen the Lord this angry. They all refused to approach the Lord. Because he was so angry, they were fearful. Who was not fearful? The Lord Maharaj simply went to the Lord, offered his obeisances, and Narsimha Day started roaring like a lion, scooped up for the Lord Maharaj, brought him on his lap, started licking him like a lion licks his cup and just showering love. This is the power of the devotee. The devotee can even change the mood of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the purity of his bhakti, by the purity of his love. Even that angry Lord Ashikide became the gentle lion So, 
when Lord Yeshua did. Tells the Lord, I'm very pleased with you. Please ask some benediction from me. The Lord Maharaj said, I am very fearful of these benedictions. Because all of these benedictions, they are impediments, obstacles to my bhakti. Please don't tempt me with some benedictions. If you want to give me a benediction, give me the benediction that I'll never ask for a benediction. Because I have already the greatest thing I can achieve, which is your love and shelter. What more I can ask for? I have seen what benedictions have done to my father and where he lies now. Why do I want to follow that same path? Please, Krishna, please, Shishi Radha Kuntrari, don't tempt me with the material boons because they will lead to my liberation. But please give me the taste and privilege of your devotional service. That is what the benediction is. And Prahlad Maharaj suggests that. And he does many other great um, uh, prayers in this movie. So as I mentioned in the beginning, giving just a brief overview of this beautiful pastime. There's much more in these uh, 10 or so chapters. And I hope we'll all go back and read more of this to be able to uh, absorb so many more of the teachings and pastimes. But to summarize, in quick summary, Hirani Kashyap will achieve all the strength, power, fame, wealth of the world, yet he could not find peace. Prahlad Maharaj is a five-year-old boy just by the process of hearing and faith in the Supreme Lord was able to find complete peace and happiness. So now the choice is ours. Every day I wake up, I have only two choices. Either I'm going to go out and serve my own senses, or I'm going to go out and serve the Lord. Two choices. You have a very vivid example of the outcomes of both, and now it is up to all of us as individuals to decide which is best for me. And if we decide to take to the process of devotional life, how to do it? Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Shmaranam. Hearing, hearing from the Supreme Lord through Guru Parampara is the means to purify the heart, to shake free of all the contamination. I could hear it. And by chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare By the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, one will remove the impurities of the heart and bring the mind and senses into control and make them our best of friends. And we should have full faith that when we chant out to the Lord, that prayer never goes unanswered. When Prahlad Maharaj said, My Lord is even in the pillar, the Lord appeared from the pillar. Krishna gives himself fully to his devotees. And we see that in his appearance to protect Prahlad Maharaj. And the final moral, what it is that we really want to protect what is our greatest possession? It is our opportunity to render service to the Supreme Lord. And that is what we pray to Lord Yashimene for protection of today. We pray, please protect me on the path of devotional service. Please don't let my false ego, the impurities of my pride, envy, illusion, and greed pull me away and take me into the ditch of material life, but keep me on the path the golden road back to back to God. Please, Lord Krishna, bestow upon me this benediction so that I may also become your devotee, following in the footsteps of the great
We're going to set up for Abhishek here in a few moments, but while the devotees are setting up for Abhishek, do uh, we have any comments or questions? Yes. What, because um, this is more from reading, but I know from your, you're qualified to answer this. But uh, <laughs> um, if all the living entities are part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, what distinguishes, um, I remember reading a purport in which Srila Prabhupada said, we should not engage, devotees should not engage in activities that might hamper <laughs> Krishna conscious activities. So what distinguishes uh, an, a material activity from a Krishna conscious that might hamper a Krishna consciousness activity if all living entities are part and parcel if I'm serving one? Yes, yeah, so the question is if all living entities are part and parcel of Krishna, what is the delineation between uh, a spiritual activity and a material activity? If I'm serving another living entity who's also part and parcel of Krishna, then isn't that also serving Krishna? Is that a spiritual activity or a material activity? So what delineates? So in this example we can understand that in the battle of Kurukshetra, Arjuna is shooting arrows and Duryodhana is shooting arrows. Both are shooting arrows. But what is the difference? One is shooting arrows under the instruction of their own false ego. The other is shooting arrows under the instruction of Krishna. Thus, one is performing devotional service and one is performing asura activities. So it is not the action that one is performing. It is the cause or reason, the inspiration for the action behind it. When one acts under the guidance of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, and Krishna, it is devotional service. So yes, serving our friends and neighbors through the prescribed ways, distributing prasadam, spreading the holy names, distributing books, that is serving Krishna. But serving my neighbors by inviting them home into my home and intoxicating and enjoying material sense enjoyment, that is, creating an impediment for them and ourselves in devotional service. So, the service must come with the goal of bringing them closer to Krishna, but under guidance and instruction. Then it is devotional service. So, that is why the materialist goes to the office and the devotee goes to the office. <laughs> but the result is very different. Couldn't be more opposite. Prahlad Maharaj was a pure devotee of the Lord. Did he end up an ascetic in the forest? No. He went out to rule and became king of the whole universe. Becoming a devotee does not mean renouncing our duties and retiring to the forest. It means engaging in what Krishna has planned for us. Krishna wanted Prahlad Maharaj to become king. He became king. Why chant 16 rounds? Is one enough? Or why only 16? So when you go to the doctor, you ask the doctor, Doctor, can you only partially cure me? Do you go like that? No? What do you ask the doctor to do? Complete cure. I want full cure. I don't want partial cure. So when the doctor gives you medicine, who decides how many pills to take? You or doctor? Why does doctor decide? Because yes, I'm not doctor. Because you're not doctor. Yes, and doctor knows. So chant 16 rounds. <laughs> Why? Because Shri Prabhupada and Guru Prabhupada said. Why? Because you and I, at least me more than you, are very sick, very contaminated, very polluted. 
So one round is great, extraordinary, unbelievable. But 16 is even better. Because that is the dosage I need, we all need, to counteract the uh, influence of my mind. So there is a dosage given. But if I and you and I define our dosage, it's like uh, you and I defining the dosage to the doctor. Doctor, I think I can eat seven rasgulas tomorrow, even though I have diabetes, no problem. I won't eat eight. So, based on Shastra, this is the potency of the holy names that is required. Now, we should understand that this chanting process, 16 rounds, that is the minimum. Why do we need a minimum? Because we have not yet experienced the taste of the holy names. When we uncover the taste of the holy names by purifying from the anarthas, then actually it will be chanting 24-7 because the taste is so sweet. Each time I chant Krishna, it is an overwhelming experience of ecstasy that what do I want to do again? Chant Krishna. And again, and each time I chant, it's sweeter and sweeter. But I'm not in that state. Each time I chant, I'm feeling all oh, sleepy, tired, my goal is finished, my rounds are almost done, I can put my bead bag away and see it tomorrow. Why? Rupa Goswami explains in that third instruction, because we are jaundiced. We are in an ignorant state. When you are jaundiced, when something is sweet, what, how does it taste? Bitter. And when something is bitter and you taste it, how does it taste? Sweet. Because your taste buds are sick. So similarly, in our avidya state, this chanting is actually sweet. But it tastes a little bit bitter, a little bit difficult. Why? Because I'm jaundiced. What is my jaundice? Avidya ignorance. So just in the jaundice, how do you cure jaundice? You keep eating that sugar cube, even though it tastes bitter. And by eating the sugar cube, soon the real sweetness of that sugar cube will resume. So similarly, because we are in the Avidya state, we have to chant. Even though we might not love it yet, we might not understand, have the full knowledge. Don't worry, just do it. Because it is actually sweet. And by chanting, we'll cure our jaundice-like condition of ignorance. And soon the sweet taste of that chanting will emerge. And thus we'll enjoy knowledge. And that is the instruction of Rufa Goswami in that instruction. So chant, chant, and more chant. Because of our now, our now, our now, I can tell you, came along the world, this year, this year, this year, this year. There is no other way, there is no other way, there is no other way. Then, chanting of the Holy Names, chanting of the Holy Names, chanting of the Holy Names. It is the all powerful process. The expansion of the Holy Names, Hare Krishna. Huh? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare. It is the Maha Mantra. Maha Mantra. It means the potency of all other mantras are included within this single mantra. We have many, 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 many mantras. And the potency of all of them is embedded in one. So just chant this mantra. It is the ultimate glorification of Radha and Krishna. Hare Krishna explains he's invoking the pleasure potency of the Supreme Lord. And Krishna is the all attractive personality. Rama, the source of all pleasures. It is the glorification of the Lord. So it is the purification of ourselves and the glorification of the Supreme Lord. This is the Mahamantra in a nutshell. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. So now we'll have Kirtan and we'll prepare for Abhishek.